and I laid out our conservative principles and what we as a party believe. And when it was over, this nice lady stood up in the back and she said, you know, I hate you. <laughs> And she walked all the way to the front and turned around and looked at the group and said, I hate you. I've been a teacher for 28 years. I've been a member of this union since it began. I am a lifelong Republican, and this is the first time you've had someone come to this meeting who actually shares my beliefs. Jim Brulte, who would grow up to be the Republican leader in both houses of the California legislature, was raised in the then small town of Ontario, California, at a time when Republicans from California dominated both state and national politics. Brulte was the middle of three sons, born to a father who worked in the aerospace industry and a mother who was a nurse. My dad was really smart. Um, you know, I don't think he had uh, a very outgoing personality. Um, uh, he uh, was very willful, um, very, very disciplined. I remember uh, late in life, um, I knew he had gone to the doctor. I came back home uh, from high school, I think, and uh, he was smoking a cigarette. And I said, uh, what did the doctor say? He said, well, the doctor said I have to quit smoking. <laughs> I said, well, well, why do you have a cigarette in your hand? He said, you know, when I finish this pack, I'm going to quit. And he finished the pack, and he never picked up another cigarette. And I don't understand that. Um, you know, that's the kind of will and discipline that I certainly don't have. I was a lot closer to my father. Um, I wasn't, wasn't so close to my mother. Um, actually, you know, the cardinal sin for me, my friends know this, that uh, embarrassing me, that's a cardinal sin. I don't like to be embarrassed. Um, my mother used to embarrass me because, you know, she just said whatever she thought was on her mind. And, and you know, I, I didn't particularly find that appealing. So I wasn't that close to my mother. In fact, for a good part of my life, I didn't like my mother. You know, those are the folks that I served with in Sacramento know my mother came down with Alzheimer's. And while I was in the Senate as Senate Republican leader, I had to become the caregiver for my mother. I moved her into my house um, and basically provided her care, which wasn't all that easy when I wasn't at home three nights, four nights a week. Um, I would travel, take her with me when I traveled. Um, uh, and it's interesting, you know, people came up and said, oh, this is such a wonderful thing you're doing for your mother. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not doing it for her. Uh, you know, I don't want her to die and me have issues. <laughs> so I, I did it for me. And interesting, over the course of three and a half years, I fell in love with this old woman. I don't have kids. Um, so the concept of joy was something I never understood. You know, people talk about my grandparents or, or my grandkids or my joy or my kids or my joy. Being able to take care of my mother really taught me what joy was. And um, when, uh, when she died, I was pretty devastated. And, you know, to this day, you can show me a picture of my mother when she was in her 30s or 40s, and it does absolutely nothing for me but you can show me a picture of my mother when she was 81 and it just breaks my heart. Um, well, you know, I don't like government. The Veterans Administration killed my dad. They botched an operation. Um, in fact, they did the wrong operation. Um, and uh, 
from late April of 1985 until July of 85 when he died. They did three more operations. He was in uh, intensive care the whole time, had a tracheotomy, couldn't get off his back. Um, and uh, so he, um, you know, he had the last two and a half, three months of his life were sheer misery. Um, but, you know, both of my parents uh, knew the Lord. Both of my parents are in heaven. Um, they're in a much better place than, than I am today, and I can't wait until the Lord calls me home and I get to join them. I'm, I'm one of those that uh, didn't talk a lot when I grew up. I didn't share my feelings. Um, so I, I suffered depression when I was younger. Um, I still can get depressed today, but the depression isn't anywhere near as deep as it used to be when I was a kid and doesn't last anywhere near as long as it, as, as it did. So I had, um, I had severe depression when I was growing up. Um, Nervous stomach, um, series, uh, uh, a feeling of impending doom, you know, a desire not to want to wake up in the morning, not to want to get out of bed, um, uh, a desire to just cloister yourself, and, you know, all the things that you probably shouldn't be doing. You know, today, you know, they treat um, depression with, with drugs. I never thought about killing myself, but there were days where I wouldn't have been unhappy if I didn't wake up. Hmm. But, you know, I think one of the things, um, one of the things I remember at one point, uh, I believe it was in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, I was the only Republican in either house of the legislature that supported parity for mental health services within health insurance plans. Um, and I think that's because I understood, you know, the problems people have. In 1974, a Republican president from California had already brought a bitter conclusion to the war in Vietnam. Democrats in the California State Assembly were collaborating with Republicans as they competed to be the next speaker. A Republican governor was beginning to look toward bigger things. And 18-year-old Jim Brulte was bucking a national trend of young people staying away from the military by enlisting. So I had this attitude of service when I was growing up. In my senior year in high school, you know, the draft had ended when I was a junior. The war in Vietnam had ended. I think the draft had ended maybe when I was a freshman. The war in Vietnam had ended, um, but I wanted to serve. And so I enlisted in the California Air National Guard when I was uh, a senior. I graduated Wednesday. I uh, went to grad night at Disneyland with my high school girlfriend and my best friend, Mickey, and his girlfriend. And Sunday morning, I flew to Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, and um, did Air Force basic training, did the security training school and got back about two and a half weeks before Chafee Community College started. So I, I wanted to serve. I had a great time uh, in the military. Um, you know, but for the fact that I believe in liberty and freedom, I would probably believe in compulsory uh, national service. We had a kid from Iowa, never forget this, 18 years old and uh, he was in our squadron at Lackland Air Force Base. 18-year-old kid from Iowa. He had never been in the presence nor seen an African-American, uh, Mexican-American, or someone of Jewish ancestry. Now, I don't understand how you can be 18 and never have that experience. And so I really loved um, military basic training because it allowed me to interact with people from all different walks of life, all different social spheres, um, all different states. And it's a great equalizer. You know, when you're getting yelled at in the rain, um, 
it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you came from. <laughs> you know, you're just a different piece of dirt um, that somebody's yelling at until you, you know, finish your training. A veteran, a college graduate, a political volunteer of some note and reputation in Ontario, the ever increasingly ambitious Brulte goes to the center of American politics for greater training. Well, you know, I've had the privilege of, of, of serving three American presidents, um, all in different ways. I, when I went to Washington, D.C. in 1981, and I went to Washington because the best and the brightest in this profession are there. Um, and uh, in, in a fairly concentrated, small geographic area. So the ability to learn is great. You know, I always, I always wanted to be the dumbest guy in the room because if you're the dumbest guy in the room, you can learn from everybody else in the room. And um, I had a number of goals. I wanted to work on Capitol Hill. I did. I was a male receptionist in the U.S. Senate. I may have been the only male receptionist at the time. I wanted to work at the Republican National Committee, which I did. I wanted to work at a Republican convention, which I did, 1984. I wanted to work um, in the Reagan-Bush administration, which I did. I wanted to work in the president's re-election. I helped uh, in the re-election of Ronald Reagan. He got 59% of the vote, I think, and I'm pretty sure all of us helped him get 2%, and he got the other 57 himself. For George Herbert Walker Bush, I was one of his advance men, um, which is a real fun experience if anybody's ever had the opportunity to do it. And, um, you know, I was the co-chair of the Bush for President campaign in California in, uh, when George W. Bush was running. So I had the opportunity to get to know then Governor Bush. Um, and I asked him, uh, to put me on the Naval Academy Board of Director, Board of Visitors. So I served on the Naval Academy Board of Visitors. Um, was an opportunity to serve without having to go back to Washington, D.C. and serve. I met George W. Bush, I believe in 1997 in Washington, D.C. A friend of mine was very close to him. She introduced me to him. We had a very interesting talk in his hotel room, um, mentioned some things of, he was doing um, and uh, we had a great conversation and I understand that uh, I made an impression on him so um, when Karl Rove came to California to help set up the Bush for President campaign um, I, I was high on the list of someone they wanted to have involved and I actually wrote the primary campaign plan for California for uh, then the governor of Texas and if people remember John McCain said that he would stay in the race if he carried California, but he'd drop out if he didn't, and we whooped him pretty bad here in California, and he dropped out of the race, and George W. Bush became president, and, you know, I had a couple of requests. I wanted to fly into California on Air Force One on the very first trip, you know, which I did. I wanted to see a movie in the White House. I didn't, but I spent the night. Um, that was kind of cool. Five years in Washington proved enough. Now, approaching 30, Brulte missed the surroundings of his hometown and was anxious to make his own mark in California Republican politics. You know, it's interesting. I had um, come back from Washington in 1986. I had uh, wanted to come home. I had done everything I wanted to do in Washington, D.C. I met all of my goals, and I wanted to come home because I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm conservative. It's not just a philosophical thing. I, I've never felt home anywhere outside about 15 miles from where I grew up. I never felt at home in Sacramento, never felt at home in D.C. I like to eat at the same places. I like to eat the same meals. You know, I'm not very... Um, uh, adventurous when it comes to that. So I wanted to come home. You know, in Washington, I was a junior nobody, you know, a little junior nobody uh, in a very big pond. And, but, you know, when I came home, you know, the skills I had learned from some of the best and the brightest, you know, they were a little bit better than the indigenous 
skill set of the folks in the communities. Brulte used his considerable political and managerial skills to get work as a legislative aide to an incumbent Republican assembly member, a businessman named Chuck Bader. Ultimately, the job working the assembly district would lead to Brulte becoming a viable candidate himself. Chuck Bader is a great man. Chuck Bader is, is my uh, old boss. He was a member of the assembly. Um, he was a conservative Republican, but he was, he was somebody that was willing to think outside the box. He believed in public education. You know, his wife was a school teacher. Um, so he was, you know, he served on the education committees. Um, uh, he was a businessman, so he cared about business issues. He understood what it took to have a, a, a healthy business climate. You know, the rap on him internally was that he was, you know, always going after Willie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Willie Brown was a very powerful uh, speaker and used to reward his friends and punish his enemies. And um, so, you know, when I got here to Sacramento, um, I wanted to distinguish myself from Chuck in two ways. First, I never wanted to serve on an education committee, um, which is interesting because I think I probably was one of the foremost uh, Republicans with knowledge of the education world. And um, I wanted to make it clear to Willie Brown that I would, I would be a warrior out in the campaign world, but, you know, I understood. This was his house. So there were three of us that were going to run for the assembly in uh, 1989. Every Republican mayor in the district endorsed me, and every Republican supervisor in the district endorsed me. And a lot of the people who had seen what I had done to build the party and help elect others were helpful to me, and I had the endorsement of the incumbent. And um, I ended up winning my primary with 75% of the vote in a two-person race. Brulte was sworn into office in the California State Assembly in December of 1990. He was 34 years old, and his star was quickly rising. He would be elected Republican leader in his freshman year, a feat that would be repeated when he was elected to the Senate, making him the only person in California history to lead his party as a freshman in both houses. So in retrospect, I don't know that it was all that difficult, but it sure seemed difficult at the time. And I'm, I'm one of those who believes that you always have to run like an underdog. You know, you never want to leave anything. You want to leave it all out on the field. Uh, my first swearing in was 26 years ago. And um, so I'm not sure I remember who came with me, but I think my, I know my mom was there. Um, I don't know if my brothers were there, um, but I know my mom was there. Um, and there were some people from the local community, but I don't, I don't really remember much about my first swearing in, other than the fact that um, I kept waiting for this emotional experience to take place. You know, if you've worked, you know, if you've worked in presidential campaigns, you know, there's nothing like having Marine One land and hear ruffles and flourishes and then hail to the chief and have the President of the United States get out of Marine One or get out of Air Force One. And um, it's, it really is this emotional kind of just wonderful overwhelming experience. And I kept waiting for that happen. Uh, I kept waiting for that to happen when I got to Sacramento. It never happened in 14 years. It was a different experience. I remember I told my mother a couple days before I was sworn in that I figured it out. And um, if when I left I could look myself in the mirror and know that I had never compromised myself, my principles, or my values, then my time in Sacramento would be successful, whether I served one term or four. And I'm proud to say that when I left, um, I could look myself in the mirror and, and uh, I didn't compromise my principles and I didn't compromise my values. So, irrespective of what anybody in the world thinks about my service, I'm proud of what I did. 
I'm always asked, were you more of a political strategist or a policy maker? You know, I, I believe in public policy. I think good public policy is um, good politics. Um, but when I was elected Republican leader in 1992, and we went into the 1994 election cycle, first of all, in early 1993, we won a special election. I helped elect Bruce McPherson to the state assembly in a district that Republicans hadn't had for, what, 20 plus years. And then in November of 1994, we picked up eight seats, took out five incumbent, Democrat incumbents in one night. We had, uh, I think Willie had only lost two incumbents up until that point, Willie Brown. So I got this reputation at, of being really good at politics. Um, which is interesting because I think I'm a policy person at heart and I just see politics as a vehicle to win your policy battles. For the longest time, you know, no one would ever credit me with understanding policy. And I actually went um, a whole, uh, almost a year, I told my press secretary, I will never answer a reporter's question about politics, you know. We're not answering any questions about politics because I'm tired of being seen in the media as this political guy. I'll only answer questions about policy. And, you know, if you study my career, although no one really should or, you know, would, you know, I had a fairly decent legislative career and had impact on a number of uh, good public policy. Also got a couple of them wrong. In the late 1990s, a spate of stories emerged of scared young mothers deserting their newborn babies. Children left, in some instances, to die. Brulty, the conservative bachelor with no children of his own, responds by writing SB 1368. People ask me, what's the most important thing you ever did in government? Um, um, I, I wrote the Safe Arms for Newborns bill, which allows people to, young girls, to take their babies to a firehouse or a hospital and within 72 hours of the birth of the child and turn the baby in, no questions asked. You know, we, we found, we had this period in California where people were throwing babies away in dumpsters. So one girl at her high school prom had a baby and threw it in the trash can. And, you know, these babies are innocent. they have not in a position to care for themselves. So I wrote the Safe Arms for Newborns law in California. We did it as a three-year test case. It has subsequently been renewed, and it's now permanent law in California. It by far is the most important thing I've ever done in public service and probably in my entire life. After orchestrating historic Republican gains, in 1994, the strategist Brulty is in line to take on a legendary speaker. He challenges the fiery Willie Brown to lead the California State Assembly. His only problem is a rogue Republican named Paul Horcher, with whom Brulty has had a cold relationship, and Willie Brown has carefully fostered a friendship. Horcher has the deciding vote. The next order of business is a nomination and election of officers. The nominations are now open for the Office of Speaker for the California State Assembly for the 1995-96 session. Hauser, Hauser, Brown, Hawkins, Hawkins, Brulte, Hoag, Hoag, Brulte. Horcher, 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 Brown, House. Paul Horcher sides with Willie Brown. Brulte will never become Speaker. The name that my, um, my Democrat friends like to whisper in my ear all the time is Paul Horcher. Um, in 
1994, we were able to pick up, you know, enough seats to get 41 seats in the state legislature, in the state assembly. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I had met with our consultants um, and told them that, you know, I was going to, it just felt like it was going to be a good year for us. I don't, you know, I didn't have a lot of data, but it just felt like it was going to be a good year. So we borrowed some money. And I said, let's shoot the moon. But whatever, get us 39 seats or get us 42. But whatever you do, don't get us 40 or 41, because I don't want to have to deal with Paul Horcher. So we got uh, 41 seats in the state assembly uh, in 1994. Now, I should tell you, it was never my goal to be Speaker of the Assembly. It was just something that, you know, it was, I just wanted to serve my time and maybe move the ball a little bit, make California a little bit more conservative. So we got 41 votes. Um, Paul Horcher, as you know, um, voted for Willie Brown and registered uh, independent that day. And it began a one-year fight for the speakership, which is really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, like many things, the media got it, a lot of it wrong. Um, because, you know, the media, at least some of the media up here, is kind of in the tank for the team that's generally in charge. But in the first battle for the speakership, we won. We got 41 votes. Um, and then in the second battle, Willie won because he turned Paul Horcher. Um, he had actually, uh, we found out afterwards that he had met with Horcher in May and Will, Horcher said, I'm going to change parties. And Willie said, no, if you change parties, you'll lose. Stay as a Republican. You can register afterwards. So in the second battle in the speakership war, uh, Willie and the Democrats won. They elected, or uh, they got Paul Horcher to flip. Uh, in the third battle, we recalled Paul Horcher and elected Gary Miller. We won. In the fourth battle, they flipped Doris Allen. She became speaker with Democrat votes. In the fifth battle, we won. We recalled Doris Allen. In the sixth battle, we elected, um, or they flipped Brian Sentensich, a freshman um, who the previous December credited his victory to me. Um, and that was the end of the game in 1995, and then in early 96 we came back. Jan Goldsmith made a motion to elect Jim Brulte temporary presiding officer. I was elected temporary presiding officer of the assembly. We won that battle. We changed uh, the rules. Um, we stripped the speaker of his authority. We put it in the head of the rules committee. The Rules Committee chair was going to be picked by the majority party, which in our case was us. Um, uh, we had a caucus. I was not interested in being a speaker because I was running for the state senate. I'd already announced I was running for the state senate. I'd stepped down as the assembly leader, I think, in September of 95. Kurt Pringle was our candidate. And so in the final battle of the speakership, um, we elected Kurt Pringle in, I think, January 4th or 5th of 1996. Um, now, Paul Horcher, you know, Paul was an interesting guy. Um, you know, Willie, and I don't know where he gets this. I mean, Willie Brown is a brilliant man. I have nothing but admiration and respect for his political skills. But Willie, and maybe he got it from his working with his client base in San Francisco early in his law career. Willie is really good at understanding people's human weaknesses and the underside that they have. Um, and that is a skill that he fully developed as speaker. It's why he remained a speaker for so long. It's why he got the speakership in the first place and why he held on to it until after the 94 elections. Um, it's not particularly my skill set. You know, I'm not good at looking at the underside of people. I don't want to see the underside of people. The day that I lost the speakership um, wasn't that difficult for me 
because I had always expected Paul Horcher to do the wrong thing. Um, in fact, you know, um, you know, I'll never forget we were down at a hotel in Los Angeles. Pete Wilson had been reelected fairly easily. Uh, we had elected um, a state insurance, uh, we elected a state controller, we elected a state, uh, we reelected Dan Lundgren, we elected a secretary of state, we elected an insurance commissioner. It was a great night for us. And while everyone was ecstatic that we came back with 41 Republicans in the assembly, my chief of staff and I were horrified. And we were horrified at the prospect of 41 because we had served with Paul Horcher. Brulte will not only serve under governors from both parties, he will work closely with most of them, formulating California public policy. Yeah, I was elected when George Duke Majin was governor, but I'd, I'd only met him once, uh, and it wasn't, um, uh, wasn't a meeting per se. I was doing advance for uh, the vice president of the United States, so I had, uh, I was the offstage announcer to introduce uh, the governor and, and Mrs. Duke Majin into the room. And I remember I got it wrong. I said, please welcome Governor and Mrs. Gloria Duke Majin. <laughs> and <laughs> Governor Duke Majin looked at me and said something about, well, that's interesting, and turned his head and walked in the room. That was my only uh, conversation with Governor Duke Majin. Um, and, you know, I was sworn in, I believe, in December of 90. Pete Wilson got sworn in in January. So, um, you know, I was just this freshman junior nobody um, when Pete Wilson was elected governor. Um, I, I was part of the conservative group in the assembly, um, the so-called moderate Republicans. And I want to say from late 1991 up until the election in 1992, almost the entire Wilson operation uh, were on a jihad to destroy my career. Uh, in fact, Pete Wilson himself, election night, spoke to a man named Tirso Del Junco, a man who um, is like a father to me. And he was personally criticizing me to Tirso. And Tirso, you know, told me about it, of course, that night and said to Governor Wilson, you don't know Jim Brulte. And of course, you know, that was election night. Bill Jones was supposed to be the next speaker. In fact, he wasn't the next speaker. We lost seats. Most of my colleagues asked me to run. So I was drafted to run for assembly leader. And Thursday after the election, I was unanimously elected leader in the assembly. Um, did not have much of a relationship with Wilson. Uh, and it was, the relationship I had was not good. Um, and interestingly enough, Pete was um, I, I know, 30 plus points behind Kathleen Brown in the polls for governor following the 92 election. And I called Pete Wilson after I was elected um, leader, said I'm fully committed to your reelection, which I think surprised him. Uh, I want to work with you. I want you to make, I want your agenda to get through. And, you know, you don't know me very well, but I want to be a partner as we move California in, in the right direction. And over a period of time, I, I believe um, Pete Wilson and I became very, very close allies. You know, we went into our first big five. You know, I'm this kid, I'm in my 30s. And the big five is a group of the legislative leaders and the governor who, you know, make decisions on the budgets and things like that. And Pete Wilson is there, and David Roberti is there, and Ken Maddy is there, and Willie Brown is there, and I'm there. And they're all old enough to be my father. Interestingly enough, Willie was the only one willing to claim parentage. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, over the first budget negotiation, Willie and Pete hadn't spoken you know, it's interesting. Willie and Pete hadn't spoken for, since the election. Uh, they had really personally attacked each other over, over the course of 
uh, the 92 campaign, and they had not spoken uh, until I actually brought them together. Um, I thought we could get a budget deal because Willie thought we could get a budget deal. I'll never forget this. Um, you know, Willie is such a master of drama. Uh, I said to Governor Wilson, look, why don't you just trust me? If I'm wrong on this, you will have wasted 20 minutes. If I'm right, we may actually get a budget deal. And anybody who's been in the governor's office know governors tend to meet in the Ronald Reagan conference room, uh, cabinet room, and there's a big long table, at least there was when uh, Pete Wilson was governor. Um, and the governor would sit at the head of one table and the legislative leaders would sit across from each other. And we came in and Willie Brown sat across from me and he wouldn't look at Pete Wilson. He just wouldn't look at the governor and I thought, oh good God, I've been pantsed. You know, all of my discussions with Willie and the son of a gun has pantsed me. And uh, Willie says, have you seen any good movies lately, Jim? And we started talking about movies. And I don't remember the first couple of movies we talked about. And then I said, yeah, I just saw the movie Dave. And if you remember, the movie Dave was about a president who had a stroke and some guy who looked like him played by, I think, Kevin Klein. And um, Willie had seen it. And Pete Wilson said, you know, Gail and I just saw that movie last weekend. And Willie Brown snaps his head to the left and looks at Pete Wilson and starts talking to Pete Wilson about the movie Dave. And after a couple of minutes of discussion about the movie Dave, um, Willie says, you know, Governor, I have an idea on how we can solve the budget. And he pulls out this paper and has these numbers written out. And we had a discussion for about 25 minutes maybe. And Willie left and Pete Wilson said to me, that's the most productive meeting I've had with Willie Brown since I've been governor. And I believe that meeting took place at 10 o'clock on a Friday morning. And by Sunday, we had a budget deal and we had the first on-time budget uh, in a long time. And that was in 1993. I loved Gray Davis. I'm, I'm not a, a strike that I don't love Gray Davis. Um, you know, I'm not a professional Gray Davis hater. Um, I actually felt sorry for Gray Davis. Uh, he worked really hard to be governor, and then I don't think he really enjoyed being governor. Um, in a lot, of, a lot of the times, I was his closest legislative ally on some of the things he wanted to do. But I think after 16 years of Republican governors, the pressure from the liberal interest groups and organized labor to um, get what they wanted um, really put a lot of pressure on him. When Governor Davis was being recalled and the Re Democrats in the legislature could have given him a lifeboat, they threw him an anchor. They passed two or three pieces of legislation that he was screwed if he signed and screwed if he vetoed. And I think that's really interesting. It's an interesting study of power. It was more important to get what they wanted than to protect a governor of their own party. I like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He sees the world differently than most normal people do. Um, I'll never forget him lecturing someone in Big Five who said, well, you can't do it that way. Um, he said, don't tell me it can't be done. I was told I could never be Mr. Universe, I'm Mr. Universe. I was told I couldn't be an actor, I was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. I was told I couldn't be governor, I'm governor of California. Tell me it's hard to do, but don't ever tell me it can't be done. And he's really an inspirational uh, person and has a great life story. In 2004, Brulte leaves the California State Senate because of term limits taking on a partnership in a business consulting firm, he begins to assess the next chapter of his life. The, the issue of marriage always comes up. I'm 60 and I've never been married. You know, my mother always told me, when it's right, you'll know it. And, you know, I've, I've been blessed to have some fabulous relationships. I've been involved with some of the, the most wonderful women that 
that God ever created. Um, but, you know, I, I just hasn't felt like I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. And this, you know, I'm not critical of people, but most of the people I know are on their second, or in some cases, third marriage. Now, I'm not critical of them because I've never been to bat. I mean, I'm O for O. Um, but I'm hopeful. And, you know, at this point in my life, I don't want to think that I've been doing it wrong. So I'm still hopeful that I'll find somebody that I'll be blessed to spend the rest of my life with. You know, this is a unique job. Serving in the legislature is a unique job. First of all, less than 5,000 Californians have had the privilege of doing that. You get to interact with the most, some of the most fascinating people from all walks of life. Um, you know, this is a very diverse legislature with very different backgrounds, and the opportunity to interact with them is great. You get to deal with the widest variety of issues. You are basically your own boss because you can't work for the 858,000 people that I used to represent. And back there with benefits and, you know, salary and benefits, um, you didn't make an insignificant amount of money. It was probably worth 180,000, give or take, uh, when I was there. And I asked myself, where do you get a job like that when you leave? And the answer was, you probably don't. So when I left the legislature, I actually left. And I didn't miss it at all, but I had prepared myself for that. Um, you know, then I went into the private sector and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that much different, you know. Um, you know, I got to read newspaper reports that were erroneous. You know, I got to read that I was a lobbyist. You know, well, I was never a lobbyist, have never been a lobbyist, don't want to be a lobbyist. But was, wasn't much different than being in the legislature. The press would write things that didn't necessarily have any basis in reality. Um, but I got to deal with issues. I got to pick clients that I agreed with and um, still got to do something to help make positive public policy, but I got paid a little bit more for doing it, um, and I enjoyed it. In 2013, Brulte, at the age of 57, is asked to run for chair of the California Republican Party. He agrees, he wins, and the rules will eventually be changed to keep him in the post past term limits. So I think I probably get a little bit more scrutiny than the average former legislator, and now I'm chairman of the California Republican Party, so I suspect I get more scrutiny there. Well, one of the challenges I have as chairman of the Republican Party is trying to explain to the base vote of Republicans and party leaders themselves the changing demographics of California. This is not the California I grew up in. You know, when I was a kid, you could nominate a Republican statewide and they had a 50-50 chance of winning. Well, we've lost every statewide office in three of the last four gubernatorial elections. And by the way, you have to go back to 1882 to find that happening. Um, the Republican Party has lost about 12% registration over the last two decades. And by the way, when you plot it out, the decline in Republican registration parallels identically the decline in the white population in California. And 52% of the people that are going to register to vote over the next decade are Latino in California. So one of the things, you know, I've always believed in inclusion. I mean, read the Washington Post back in 1996 and you'll find a front page story by David Broder um, talking about how I think we need to do a better job of recruiting people who don't necessarily look like me um, or are my gender uh, to run for office. Because I believe that in a neighborhood election, the candidate who looks like, sounds like, has the shared values and the shared experiences of the majority of the people in the neighborhood tends to win. And the neighborhoods of California are changed. So one of the greatest obstacles I have as chair of the party is to try to explain, you know, what's exactly coming. The demographic changes in California, they're not going to slow down. They're going to accelerate. But we also have to have messages and policies that attract people um, 
And that's always not the easiest thing in the world to have. When you look at the states that our, our president-elect won, you know, most of them don't have the demographic complexion of California. You know, wherever you had higher um, Hispanic populations, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, he didn't win those states. Um, and, you know, the white population across the country is changing. It's shrinking. And um, Republicans have to recognize that. And we really have to work overtime to make sure we can reach out and have a message that appeals to the rapidly growing uh, voter groups, not just in California, but in a whole host of states across the country that look like California. The polarizing election of 2016 changes the political conversation. Even more, it changes the way we talk to each other. I, you know, I'm not surprised Donald Trump was elected president. I think there's a component of the electorate that is, is tired of hearing how horrible they are. You know, I don't take politics personally, but it's kind of offensive to turn on the channel for the last eight years and watch liberal commentators suggest that somehow I'm a racist because I voted for John McCain and Mitt Romney for president. I didn't vote against Barack Obama because he was black. I voted against Barack Obama because he was a Democrat. I've never voted for a Democrat for president, don't intend to vote for a Democrat for president. And when you confuse partisanship with racism, I mean, first of all, you diminish the horrors of racism. I mean, racism is abhorrent and has no place in, in this country. But if you suggest that somebody that votes for a Republican is racist because they voted for a Republican, that's, that sets the table for, um, for a counter reaction that's not helpful. I don't know what the next year, five years, or decade holds for me, but I want to keep living life the way I live it. You know, the Apostle Paul said I, you know, I um, ran the race, I kept the faith. And I just want to keep living that way, and when God decides to call me home, I'm ready to go, and uh, hopefully, you know, people will remember me for two or three or four years before they forget and we pass in the wind. One of my favorite Bible verses, um, uh, and it helps you keep perspective. Uh, everyone knows, I think most people know the story of Joseph. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, and he rises to become prime minister of Egypt. And according to the Old Testament, he saves both Egypt and Israel from a seven-year famine. A prime minister is second only to the pharaoh in Egypt. And it's a great story, and that's where most people end it. But if you read a couple verses farther, it says, There arose a pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And, you know, that's the way life works. And so... I've had a really good life. I've enjoyed the opportunity to be a public servant. If it ends tomorrow, I'm okay with that. I've enjoyed the opportunity to be a leader of my party. Um, I believe I have left my community a little better than I found it. And years from now, there will arise a legislator who knew not brutality and I'll be okay with that. Our time on earth is small. The question is, what have we done when we're here? And um, I probably could have done better, could have done worse, but I've done what I've done and I'm quite comfortable with who I am.